great that we can be here together worshiping God. It's a wonderful day. Uh, if you would, uh, in a little while, if you could take the attendance pad and fill it out and pass it down the aisle, pull off your sheet and put it in the, uh, in the offering plate as it comes by, that would really help us out a lot. Now, as we turn our hearts and minds to worship, let's affirm our faith by saying together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Gracious God, in the midst of this holy time together, we give you thanks. We are thankful from the bottom of our hearts for all the many ways that you have blessed us. And God, we know that sometimes we get so accustomed to what we have that we forget that they are blessings. We were all blessed to wake this morning inside of a shelter. We were all blessed to have food on our table, to have a car to get in to get here. So many things, God, that we take for granted that we need to remember to count our many blessings and to count them one by one. Now, God, we pray for this world. If we ever needed your peace to be poured down, it is now. And so I just pray that the Holy Spirit will invade this world completely and that someday the lion will lay down with the lamb and we will know what true peace is. Now, God, we thank you for the times that you have called us to do your ministries. And we also ask for forgiveness of the times that we have refused. Help us to be more obedient to listening to your voice and to follow your directions in all that we do. And God, help us, help us to learn to be persistent about the things that really matter in life. We spend a lot of our time on stuff that's not that big a deal, but knowing Jesus Christ and having him in our hearts and sharing that love with the world is a very big deal. And so let us be persistent in doing just that. Now, God, we join together not only our voices and our minds, but our lips as we speak the words that Jesus taught us to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed it be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's stand together now and sing hymn number 66, Praise My Soul, the King of Honor.
It's so good that y'all been gone for a month, haven't you? In Mobile? Or Dolphin Island, was it fun? Oh, good. Did the rest of you have a good week, too? Good, good, good. Well, today, um, Pastor Clinton's going to talk to us about a woman that wanted something, and she wanted it so bad that she kept on and on and on and on and on asking, and she got it. Did y'all ever do that? Yeah. My kids used to, they'd say, Mommy, 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 Mommy. Sometimes I'd just say, oh, okay. But there was a time I remember when my oldest daughter was six years old. And for her birthday, she got the prettiest royal blue bicycle you've ever seen. It had a white basket on it. It even had a, a bright silver bell that was so loud you could hear it everywhere. And we went over to her grandparents' house because they had a real long walkway in the back of their house, and it had a little bit of a slope to it, so we knew that would kind of help. Well, Monique got on that bike, and she tried, and she tried, and she tried. Bless her heart, she had bruises from her knee all the way down to her ankle where the pedals kept hitting her leg. But the last time I watched her, she got on that bike, she got hold of those handlebars, and she said, I'm going to ride this bike. And guess what? She did. She did. And she had a lot of years of fun on that bike. So she was persistent until she got what she wanted. And that's what God wants us to do, is to have something that matters. It matters to you and matters to God. And never give up on it. Okay, let's have a prayer. Dear God, thank you for your love. Help us to be persistent in things that matter to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Please join me in praying the offertory prayer printed in the bulletin. Gracious and giving God, thank you for the many blessings you bestow upon us. In gratitude, we now give back to you. Bless our tithes and offerings so they may grow your kingdom in our church, our community, and our world. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
15, verses 21 to 28. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word, so his disciples came to him and urged him, Send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him, Lord, help me, she said. He replied, It is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. The word of God for the people of God. Good morning. morning. We greet all of you on this Lord's Day in the name of our Christ. It is just as the disciples said to Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, it is just so good to be here. Friends, it's good to be here today to worship God together. Today we commence, uh, today through the end of the month, a sermon series of Back to Life Encounters, where over the next four weeks we're going to look at four women and their encounters of Jesus. On next Sunday, we're going to look at the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 20, verses 20 through 28, and we're going to look at Salome, the mother of James and John. And next week, we want to look at her bold request of Jesus, this bold request that she makes of Jesus. That's Matthew, the 20th chapter, verses 20 through 28. And from the scriptures that Megan read for us this morning, Uh, We want to focus on the thought, never give up. Never give up. You know, tough times often challenge our determination. It takes determination to overcome the challenges that challenge us. And even when it looks as if we are losing ground, Determination reminds us not to give up. Galatians 6 and 9, Paul says, So let us not get tired of doing good, 
for at the right time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. You see, there is nothing that can stand between us and God because the greater one is in us. 1 John, the fourth chapter, verse 4 says, We belong to God, and greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Determination. Determination pushes us to achieve in the face of difficulties. We can accomplish nothing without determination. If we are not determined, nothing can help us. But if we are determined, nothing can stop us. Determination mirrors Psalms 23 and 5, where the psalmist says, God prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies, and let's say our obstacles. The word obstacle is a compound word derived from two words, obstruction and tackle. So determination tackles and defeats every obstacle. I can remember as a little boy hearing my paternal grandmother, whom we affectionately called Big Mama, the late Clara Hubbard. Even to this day, I can hear her as if it was yesterday as a little boy seeing of her determination at Creek Stand AME Zion Church in rural Macon County. My grandmother was seeing, I shall not, I shall not be moved, just like a tree that's planted by the water, I shall not be moved. And then she'd go into that next verse, King Jesus is my captain, I shall not be moved, just like a tree that's planted by the water, I shall not be moved. So determination gives us a persistence to never give up. One of the largest organizations is the Quitters Club. And the reason that we have never heard of the Quitters Club is because they never meet. <laughs> the members quit coming. There are no dues. The members quit paying them. You know, the Quitters Club comprises people who face a tough situation in life, and they quit. In other words, when the going gets tough, the quitters get going away. So determination keeps us from being active members of the quitters club. So I want to suggest to us this morning, let's be like the postage stamp. Stick to one thing until we get there. For anything worthwhile comes because we stick at it. A father discusses with his son why he should do everything he can and never quit. He tells his son, he says, think of all the great leaders of history who did their best. Abraham Lincoln did not quit. Thomas Edison did not quit. Douglas MacArthur did not quit. And then he says, Elmo MacLimbo. And with the puzzled look, the little boy asked his father, who is that father? And his father says, see, you do not remember him. He quit. <laughs> Friends, it is always too soon to quit. And I, I'm going to say anonymous poet, even though it is a tribute to maybe three or four people. So an anonymous poet puts it like this. When things go wrong, as they sometimes will, when the road you're trudging seems all uphill, when the fawns are low and the debts are high, and you want to smile, but you have to sigh when care is pressing you down a bit. Rest if you must, but don't quit. Life is queer with its twists and turns, as every one of us sometimes learns, and many a failure turns about when we might have won had we stuck it out. So don't you quit. Though the pace seems slow, you may succeed with another blow. Success is failure turned inside out and the silver tints of clouds of doubt. And you never can tell how close you are. It may be near, 
when it seems so far. So stick to the fight when your heart is hit is when things seems worse, you mustn't quit. That's the focus of our pericope this morning. Fatigue from a busy schedule of preaching and teaching and healing envelops Jesus to the point of utter exhaustion. And in order to get some rest, Jesus and his disciples go to the region of Tyre and Sidon. Now, that's the 15th chapter. Go back and look at the first part of the chapter, even go back to a chapter, and you will see the activities of Jesus. And even just before this, how there's opposition from the Jews. So Jesus leaves from where he is, and Jesus goes to the region of Tyre and Sidon. Now, this is in Phoenicia, a, a part of modern-day Lebanon. It is outside of the territory of Israel. Simply put, it is pagan land. So, so Jesus and his disciples enjoy a nice, quiet dinner when a Canaanite woman enters the house. Now, you remember Canaanites occupied the promised land before the Israelites arrived. And, and the Canaanites are the descendants of Ham, one of the three sons of Noah. Genesis, the ninth chapter, verses 22 through 26, tells us that when Noah was drunk, he fell asleep on his bed naked. And Ham went in and saw him naked. Thus Ham and all of his descendants were cursed and destined to be slaves because it was wrong for a son to see his father naked. Now, not only is this person a Canaanite, a Canaanite, not only is this person a Canaanite, but also she's a woman. Now, remember this. Go back to John, the fourth chapter, the woman at the well. Jewish tradition forbids women from having casual conversations with a strange man, especially a religious man. So, so look what's going on here. Jesus is in the region of Tyre and Sidon, pagan land. Look what happened when this Canaanite woman approaches him. But here is this brave, courageous Canaanite, Greek, Syrophoenician, Gentile woman that approaches Jesus. And in verse 22, she asks Jesus, she says, have mercy on me, Lord, O son of David. For a devilish demon, an evil spirit, torments my daughter. Now, this narrative we'll also find in the seventh chapter of the Gospel of Mark. Now, verse 26, this is how it reads in Mark, the seventh chapter, verse 26. She begs Jesus. Mm. You notice the difference? She pleads with him in Matthew. But in Mark it says she begs Jesus to cast out the demon from her daughter. Flip back to Matthew in verse 23. Look at her. She is ignored, not once, but twice. You see that in verse 23? She is ignored. In verse 23, she is ignored. She says, Lord, have mercy on me. For my daughter has a demon that torments her severely. Watch it, watch it, watch it. Look, look, look. And Jesus ignores her. Next Sunday, I want to talk about request of when people ask a request of Jesus, and I want to deal with this one specifically on the one for next Sunday with Salome and her bold request. But look here. She is ignored twice, first by Jesus and then by the disciples. They ignore her cry for help. 
some biblical scholars suggest. Now, why did Jesus ignore her? Some say that Jesus was trying to think of what to say. Some said Jesus, even some biblical scholars says, perhaps Jesus even just wanted her to go away. They, Jesus and the disciples ignore her and her cry for help. And if you look at it, Jesus is even reluctant to talk to her. This woman, Canaanite, Greek, Syrophoenician, Gentile, Jesus, Jew. What does the law say? Mm. She irritates the disciples so much that the disciples urge Jesus to send her away. Send her away. And when Jesus does speak to her in verse 24, Listen to what Jesus tells her. She comes to Jesus, asking him to heal her daughter. And Jesus says in verse 24 that his ministry focus is the lost sheep of Israel, not the Gentiles. And then in verse 26, she reminds Jesus that not only the Jews, but also the Gentiles need your healing touch. And Jesus then gives in. Jesus commends her strong faith, and Jesus heals her daughter. Verse 20, I like, 28, I like the way the message puts it. Jesus gave in. Oh, woman, your faith is something else. What you want is what you get. And right then, her daughter became well. Friends, the determination, the persistence, of this Gentile woman. The odds are against her, yet she is determined to get healing for her daughter. And if we are determined this morning to never give up, I want to give us three nuggets to ponder as we look at this lady and I'm through. First, Jesus always does the opposite. Jesus does not rush to her aid. Jesus does not agree to follow her home. Jesus does not soothe her heart with words of encouragement. Jesus remains silent. It's right there in our pericope. Jesus remains silent. You know, this woman, she has heard that Jesus can do anything. But when she comes to Jesus for help, friends, Jesus is silent. Look at verses 22 in the A section of 23. A Gentile woman who lived there came to Jesus pleading, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David, for my daughter has a demon in her that torments her severely. But Jesus gave her no reply, not even a word. I want to submit to us this morning that when it seems like to us that God is silent, be persistent. When it seemed like to us that God is silent, be persistent. This woman is determined. She is persistent. Likewise, we must be determined. We must be persistent. Because have we ever thought about it? God often works different from us. I, I like the way... He puts it in Isaiah 55th chapter, verses 8 and 9. My thoughts are completely different from yours, and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Look at this Canaanite, this Greek, this Syrophoenician woman. Jesus ignores her, but she is persistent. The disciples ignore her, but she is persistent. Jesus ignores her request, but she is persistent. And, and the, di the disciples say they just want Jesus. Master, send her away because her begging irritates us. We're tired of her begging. It irritates us that she's begging, send her away. She's persistent. Friends, she comes for healing for her daughter. And 
And I can just imagine in my mind's eye, with the eyes of faith, I'm not leaving without it. Oh, she's persistent. Determination. You see, God is not another solution. God is the only solution. God is not a helper. God is the only help. God is not another problem solver. God is the only problem solver. Determination. Be persistent. I like the way the gospel songwriter puts it. I almost let go. I felt like I just couldn't take life anymore. My problems had me bound. Depression weighed me down. But God held me close so I wouldn't let go. God's mercy kept me so I wouldn't let go. I almost gave up. I was right at the edge of a breakthrough, but I couldn't see it. The devil really had me, but Jesus came and grabbed me, and he held me close so I wouldn't let go. God's mercy kept me so I wouldn't let go. And then the gospel writer says, so I'm here today because God kept me. I'm alive today only because of his grace. God kept me so I wouldn't let go. Now, now no, look here. Jesus is silent. Jesus is silent. The woman keeps pleading. Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. And then other voices join in. Disciples ask Jesus, get rid of her. She bothers them with her persistent begging. They show no compassion for her or sensitivity to her needs. You know, often we can become so busy with religion that we're numb to the needs around us. We can become so busy with religion that we are numb to the needs around us. But instead of being annoyed, let's look for ways to minister to others. Disciples try to persuade this woman to go away, but she will not. She is persistent. She continues to plead. In our walk with God, friends, we're going to hear discouraging voices that will tell us to give up. Give up. Your situation will never change. Give up. Your life has more questions than answers. Give up, it is useless. Give up, you will never make it. Give up, you cannot do it. But we must say, when they say give up, when these discouraging voices say give up, we must say, but God, but God. Determination, don't give up. Don't ever forget, for our God is able. Second, God never rejects us. First, Jesus ignores her. Then the disciples ridicule her. And when Jesus finally breaks his silence, he speaks words of discouragement. That day, this Canaanite, this Greek, this Syrophoenician, this Gentile woman, no doubt felt like God had rejected her. Listen to what Jesus says in verse 24. I was sent only to help the people of Israel, God's lost sheep, not the Gentiles. Now, though she may have felt like Jesus was rejecting her, here's the truth of the matter. Jesus does not reject this Gentile woman. This Canaanite woman has courage in the face of institutional prejudice. And with this Canaanite woman, Jesus signals the opening of God's kingdom to all people. He does not reject her, but with this Canaanite woman, he signals the opening of God's kingdom to everybody. Mm. Mm. God's kingdom all of us. So, so never think we're not good enough to be a part or to take part in God's kingdom. Never think 
that God does not accept us. God can use us to bring others to Christ. God has not rejected us. I like the way Augustine puts it. The church is the only organization in the world that exists for people who haven't yet joined. Let me say that again, what St. Augustine says. St. Augustine says, the church is the only organization in the world that exists for people who haven't yet joined. So friends, may we never feel like we do not belong in God's kingdom. May we never feel like the outsider looking in. We are members of the family of God. Ephesians 2.19 says, we are no longer strangers to God and foreigners. We belong in God's household with every other Christian. We are members of God's family. And then it gets sweet in verse 25. Despite the apparent apathy and rejection, look at this woman. She falls down and worships Jesus. Can we worship God? When all seems down, can we worship God? And Jesus answers her in verse 26, it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to dogs. I've got to deal with this and get to point three and I'm through. So I want to raise a question. Is Jesus calling this Canaanite, this Greek, this Syrophoenician, this Gentile woman a dog? Hmm? Is Jesus calling her a dog? Listen to what Jesus says. It's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to dogs. A woman comes for a little help, and Jesus calls her a dog. Is Jesus calling her a dog? Her daughter is demon-possessed, and Jesus labels her a dog. Is Jesus calling her a dog? We say a dog is man's best friend, but in Jesus' day, the dog was the most miserable creature on the face of the earth. Most dogs were not domesticated, and they roamed the streets barking at people. They were not cute and fuzzy house pets. They were filthy and dangerous scavengers. They were annoying, barking and howling late at night. They would lie lazily around in the daytime. But the most disgusting thing was that they would eat almost anything. They would eat from garbage piles and dumps. They would tear into the scattered, the scattered rotten carcasses of dead and decomposing animals. They were downright nasty scavengers. And as Proverbs says, the worst part is they sometimes went back to eat their own vomit. Is Jesus calling this lady a dog? Now, the original language, in the original language of the Bible, it lets us know that Jesus does not, does not, does not, does not call her a stray dog. Mm. The term Jesus uses is not as hostile as it sounds. It refers to pets, house dogs, animals permitted near the family table. But regardless, look at her response to Jesus. Her response is to worship him. And then third and finally, the key to it all. Look at it one more time and I'm through. This woman, she knows she has no right to ask Jesus for help, but she does anyway. She's a Gentile, and the Jews call the Gentiles stray dogs because they consider these pagan people no more likely than dogs to receive God's blessings. We look at it as rejection, but she sees a glimmer of hope in Jesus' words. Now notice, she does not argue with Jesus. Mm, she does not argue with Jesus. She agrees to be considered as dog as long as she can receive God's blessings of healing
for her daughter. And I like the way she put it in the 27th verse. Yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. All she needs from Jesus are the crumbs. Now, she does not ask for a lot. She accepts Jesus' priority to the Jews. And she asked for a small portion of Jesus' power. Crumbs. Crumbs. The remnants of a meal. Crumbs. What no one wants. Crumbs. The fragments of a satisfying dinner. Crumbs. What you wipe off your mouth and your plate. All she needs from Jesus are the crumbs. And she knows Jesus does not just have some power, he's got all power. Because see, even the dogs can eat the crumbs that falls from the master's table. God has all power. Ask Moses how God can divide a Red Sea and make water stand at attention. Ask Joshua about how God made the earth stand still. Ask the three Hebrew boys how God put an air conditioner in the fiery furnace. Ask Daniel about how God shut the lion's mouth. Friends, God does not have some power. God has all powers, and God's crumbs are better than anyone else's dinner. Her determination, her persistence is the result of her faith. Faith is all she has. Her faith pleads with Jesus, and it changes everything. I tried my best this week, and since I worked so hard on it, I'm going to have to say it in passing. I'm not going to try to explain it. I'll explain it later. I tried my best to connect her crumbs to her faith. Mm. Yeah, I did that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, notice what Jesus tells this Canaanite, Syrophoenician, Greek, Gentile woman in verse 28. He says, your faith is strong, and let it be done for you as you want. And the same is true for us. You see, friends, when we use our faith, it changes everything. This is where I tried to connect it, and I'll tell you. Jesus tells us in Matthew 17, 20, if we have faith, as small as a mustard seed, the smallest seed in the vegetable kingdom, Jesus says nothing will be impossible for us. Faith to believe what we have not seen. Faith to be sure of what we hope for. You see, our faith can defeat any difficulty. Our faith can face any force. Our faith can face any storm. Our faith can handle any situation. Our faith can move any mountain. Our faith can overcome any obstacle. Our faith can triumph over trouble. Our faith can bring us through anything. And our faith is what keeps us from giving up. Determination, persistence, Faith does not make things easy. Faith makes them possible. And all of God's people said, amen. If you'd like to make a decision this morning to follow Christ, become a part of our church family, or to pray at the altar, to invite you to come as we stand and sing our closing hymn, My Faith Looks Up to Thee. Shall we stand?
never give up. Our faith can handle everything. Faith does not make it easy, but faith makes things possible. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Oh.